Welcome, everyone. I'm David Kramer with the McCain Institute, and welcome to the panel on Russia's wars. It is great to be back here in Tallinn for the Lennett Mary Conference. I have been to many of these, although not for the past two years, but coming back here reminds me of feeling at home here in, in such a, a great crowd and a great country. And as I look at the election in my own country, I actually may need a home here uh, after November, so keep that in mind. Um, we have a terrific panel to get us going here, and we are going to make this as interactive as possible, bring in the audience as quickly as we can. Um, immediately to my left is my dear friend Fiona Hill, with whom I went to graduate school. She probably hopes to forget those days. Uh, Fiona is now the director of the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, and we worked together in the U.S. government when she was the national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia. Uh, to her left is uh, Mark Eliotti, professor of global affairs at New York University, visiting fellow with the European Council on Foreign Relations, and come August will be principal director of Mayak Intelligence in Prague. Yeah. Next to him is Carl Bildt, who is a former everything. Uh, <laughs> Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, Special Envoy, the list goes on and on, but we're delighted to have you here, Carl. And next to Carl is uh, Harinda Sekon, who is a senior fellow at the Vivek Kanadan, Kananda, I should have asked you how to pronounce that <laughs> before we started, International Foundation, a leading think tank based in New Delhi, and she was before that a senior fellow of, of U.S. Studies program at the Observer Research Foundation and also was a strategic analyst at the National Security Council of the Indian government. And we're delighted to have you as well. So uh, I'm going to kick this off by asking our panelists a few questions or making a few statements and trying to elicit their reaction to this. And I'm going to start with this, which is we have seen the ugliest situation unfold in Russia when it comes to the internal dynamics the, with human rights, the worst situation in Russia in decades, with a, a vicious, nasty crackdown mm -hmm. by the Putin regime, the murder of someone who uh, Pavel Demesh had sent me a photo of uh, uh, Boris Nemtsov and me and, and Andrei Sanikov on this very stage from three years ago. Um, just a, a horrendous situation internally. And therefore, we shouldn't be shocked that when the Putin regime doesn't respect the human rights of its own people, it's not going to respect the sovereignty and territorial and human rights of its neighbors or even beyond. So in, in light of that, is Russia, should we consider Russia to be an existential threat? Fiona? Actually, I don't believe that we should consider Russia to be an existential threat. Um, there is one aspect, of course, where Russia remains an existential threat, which is on the nuclear uh, front. And we've been extraordinarily concerned, especially sitting here, uh, by um, another dimension which you uh, didn't mention, which has been the saber rattling on nuclear, mm -hmm. um, uh, on the nuclear arsenal, which has not been uh, coming just from President Putin, but from um, a large number of commentators in uh, the Russian space. And clearly, when US um, military officials and others um, in uh, public presentations um, have said that Russia remains an existential threat, that's what they're referring to. But if you're starting to think overall um, about the, the Russian posture, I think there has to be a lot more nuance here. I don't disagree with what you've said. Mm -hmm. And it'll be interesting to see what my colleagues say on the panel. But I think that you know, we talk an awful lot now about um, our feelings of insecurity <coughs> towards Russia. But I think it's um, a, a pretty uh, obvious fact that uh, the Kremlin is also running scared, and uh, that we have to really start to um, inspect why is that the case. The Russians are certainly themselves frightened of something. There's a, there's a great deal of uncertainty in the world. Um, you talked about their own in a domestic situation. I think we've seen really a qualitative change um, in, in the way that Russia has started to deal with the outside world, uh, uh, emerging over a longer period of time since the mid-2000s. But 2011, 2012, Putin's return to the presidency was definitely um, a juncture here, uh, leading up, of course, uh, to the terrible um, assassination of uh, Boris Nemtsov. But you can see that in domestic politics, uh, the regime, the, the, uh, the Kremlin, got very frightened about their own grip on the situation at home. And internationally, uh, looking around uh, the world in a much more complex way, started to get very frightened about uh, what the future was holding. 
And I think we're seeing a lot of reactions to that. And the Russia is seeking itself to deter us in a very aggressive way. But we can't just you know, think about it from our own perspective all the time. We've got to really understand where is Russia and the Kremlin coming from. So I just want to put that out there as we start this discussion. Mark? Yeah, I want to start by living down to every ex expectation of the woolly-headed academic by saying existential threat, it depends what you mean. <laughs> Do I think that Russia poses a military existential threat to, to Europe? No, I do not. Yes, they obviously have nuclear capacities. They are posturing themselves in a very, very aggressive way. But I agree completely with what Fiona was saying. This is actually based on fear. This is actually based on insecurity. It is a most offensive form of defensiveness as much as anything else. Um, because they realize that essentially the West has Russia, you know, um, is, is richer, smarter, larger more military, militarily powerful and has more soft power. And they're aware of that. On the other hand, I mean, ultimately, in my opinion, what Putin wants is really, and I've sort of described it as you know, being able to opt out of the modern world as much as possible. He still wants to be connected to the financial systems and the infrastructures, but all, all this business of international law and sovereignty the etiquette of international relations is, is, is something he would rather does not apply. He just wants to have his own sandpit and his own sphere of influence. And a lot of the aggression that, that we're seeing manifested is basically an attempt to get the West to back off. Now, the point is, this is not actually a Western campaign to bring Russia to heel. It is that these are values and laws that we regard as absolutely fundamental to the modern international system and, and the, 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 the peace, if nothing else, that, that, that it actually enshrines. So in this respect, I don't see Putin as a military existential threat to Europe, but I do see Putin as an existential threat to a world order mm. which has done the West, you know, and, and indeed the world, great services over the past 50 years plus. So that, that, I think, is, is, is what Putin is doing. And the reason why that's so problematic is not just because it's Russia doing it, because after all, Russia is a declining power in so many ways. It's actually that in this respect, Russia is the point man for a variety of countries, not least China, who likewise want to see the international order restructured and, and rewritten in a way that is more convenient to them. So that is, in a way, where I think, if, if we're talking about any existential threats, it's there. So, Carl, where you stand on this issue may depend on where you sit. If you're mm. sitting in Ukraine, if you're sitting in Georgia, if you're sitting in this country, the uh, target of a cyber attack in 2007, you may have a different perspective. How, how do you see this issue? You may have a different perspective, but I would still agree with saying that uh, Russia is not an existential threat to the West, as long as the West stays united. Yeah. If the West starts to fragment, then, of course, Russia can be an existential threat to part of that area, notably, say, here. But as long as we have the cohesion of Europe, as long as we have the cohesion of the West, I fail to see that Russia has the strength, even if it wanted to, to be an existential threat to us. Uh, it is not the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union, at least for a period, had sort of ideological revolutionary potentials. Uh, they had, uh, we talk now about sort of, uh, the Putin has sort of parties in Western Europe that tends to follow his line. Uh, go back to their periods in European, Western <coughs> European history when you had very substantial communist parties with a revolutionary Soviet agenda. It was quite some time ago. Then it, we could talk about an existential threat. We are not there. Um, but as said, uh, the cohesion of the West is really the critical thing. Russia is much too weak to take on the West. That is why they're concentrated on fragmenting the West, so that they can perhaps deal with different pieces. On turn it around, um, uh, I think it's a matter of fact that the regime in the Kremlin sees the West as an existential threat to itself. Um, and we should not underestimate that. I mean, we, if we listen to them and talk to them, uh, it's called a revolution all over. And it's not that they care particularly much about Tbilisi, and to some extent they care about Kiev, but the fear is, of course, a colored revolution in Moscow. Not that I think that is in the cards, but it's obvious that they have, uh, they have a fear long term for that. And the most important, significant development that we've seen recently 
is, of course, the decision to set up this National Guard or whatever it is, right. a major reorganization of all of the internal security forces of Russia under the direct command of the president. <coughs> you don't do that if there's not a reason for it. And that reason is that this is a regime that evidently doesn't feel too confident about its own future. So, Harinda, we don't hear too often, or perhaps not often enough, the perspective coming from India on how, how India sees Russia evolving, developing. The Russia-China relationship is obviously a, a primary concern. But how would you assess the situation? Uh, firstly, I think to address your question, uh, Putin, definitely Russia is not an exist existential threat because uh, Russia has its flaws and there are very deep fault lines running through Russian society and Russia domestically and economically, socially. But Putin, what uh, I think uh, this uh, offensive in Ukraine uh, goes to show that he, Putin has been punching above his weight and he would like to gain wider acceptability, which has come. He sees that he's got this acceptability by his actions against Syria, because this is a gamble which he took by uh, bringing, up, uh, bringing up the question of Syrian refugees, and it has obviously paid off. And what Putin takes advantage of is uh, the US procrastination and selective engagement with Russia. The U.S. on the one hand needs Russia when it comes to multilateral uh, areas or it comes to the Middle East and uh, it uh, is the question of Iran, stabilizing Iran. Uh, there is no problem. The U.S. negotiates and speaks with Russia and they actually come together and work out some kind of a settlement. But when it comes further afar, uh, you know, when it's Europe, somehow it's a very confrontationist attitude. And Putin also realizes that the U.S. increasingly needs Russia because of its U.N. veto power. So that is an important thing, and that is what makes Putin very uh, uh, forceful. Uh, Putin, who's been trying to integrate, uh, you know, it's always been a westward orientation. Uh, uh, Russia's always wanted to, it's not just Putin, it began even during the Yeltsin era. Uh, Russia wanted to integrate very closely with the West. But what has happened now is its Asia pivot. Russia's Asia pivot is very distinct, but this does not mean that the Russia-China relationship is not fraught with difficulties or that there are no, no stresses over there. Um, it is one which is not a very comfortable relationship. It is more like a marriage of convenience. But for India, uh, it creates a lot of uh, problems because as it is, you have an assertive China in the South China Sea mm -hmm. and the East China Sea with its uh, policy of building these islands. And, um, you know, one must not forget that this is a region where more than 60% of our trade passes through this area, the Asia Pacific. And uh, these are very important trade routes because of the uh, raw materials, energy supply lines for Japan and for uh, Australia and even for India. And a China-Russia pivot or mm. trying to do something together in the Asia Pacific <laughs> becomes a very real problem because China, as it is, is very sensitive to the U.S. rebalance in Asia. They think that this is some kind of a China containment policy and India is the so-called linchpin as the U.S. would have everyone believe that India is the linchpin of the U.S. pivot strategy. So it uh, creates a, a very difficult situation for India. And you have to, I mean, there will come a time when we will have to take certain hard choices as we balance our growing friendship and relationship with the United States, which has emerged as India's biggest weapons supplier, arms supplier through the FMS route. And Russia, which would like to retain that pos uh, position. And you know, it becomes very tricky, and we do have this dialogue with Putin. Uh, India and Russia have the annual strategic dialogue between the heads of state. Now, this is where a lot of tensions come in, you know, so this whole thing of Russia, India, China, the United States, and India playing some kind of a hedging strategy. I think this is the important power play uh, as far as we are concerned. So, Fiona, when uh, we were in government together, um, people were talking about Russia-China relationship, and I have to say, of all the things that would keep me up at night, that was not one of them. Um, is that now a bigger concern for the West, for the United States, would you say? 
I think it gets back to um, you know what really what um, <coughs> Rinder is saying here. It really depends on your perspective on this. I mean, I think when we when we look at Russia, we tend to slice Russia up, and I think that's actually a problem that we all face when we're looking at it. And you know, with all due respect to um, you know, the conveners of the conference. You know, we're tending to look here uh, at Russia through an aperture that is obviously framed by the Baltic, uh, the NATO perspective, and, uh, and, a, and a European perspective. I think it's fantastic that Harinda is here, and I've seen Ahmed Rashid and, and a number of others who can give us um, a different perspective. <laughs> Russia is a multi-regional power by geography and also by intent. And we've seen that uh, with Russia's intervention in Syria to show, to, to point out to, particular to President Obama, who made the fatal error, I think, of pointing out that Russia was just a regional power. We shouldn't be too concerned after um, uh, Crimea and Ukraine in March of 2014 to make a point that Russia is a multi-regional power. And I think the China angle and the relationship with India is one of the most interesting that we should really be paying a lot more attention to. Because you know, if you're Vladimir Putin and you're any of the people who plan around him and they're always planning, you have to think about this huge expanse of, uh, of Russian territory. And China and the Russian relationship plays out in multiple ways. I mean, what Harinder has just said here is extraordinarily interesting from an Indian perspective. We so say you're going to have to have some hard choices. If we had a Japanese <coughs> a diplomat or analyst in the room, right. they'd say something different. They see the China-Russia relationship as part of an existential threat because they perceive that China is the greatest risk now to Japan in the Asia-Pacific. And they're looking very closely at the relationship with Russia. I think that does keep them up at night. Uh, to figure out how it is that they can hedge in the way that Harinder is talking about India uh, to really mitigate the threat that they feel from China. And we've just seen uh, Putin and Abe uh, meeting together in Sochi. Putin now personalizing the negotiations over the Kuril Islands, the Northern Territories, in a, in a very deft and clever way because he's trying to figure out how he can play now Japan and Abe in a way that will help you know, Russia's position also in the Asia Pacific. From the United States perspective, we don't pay so much attention to that because we don't tend to really think about the Japanese-Russian relationship on a uh, quite constant uh, basis when we're thinking about our relationship uh, with Russia. And obviously, the China nexus in the Asia-Pacific, China, Russia, Japan, just like China, Russia, India, has all got to be part of our calculations. So it didn't keep us up at night before, but we actually ought to be thinking more closely about how these relationships play out and how they actually all fit together here. So I do think that I mean, having horrendous perspective here is very valuable. When we start to think about Russia and the Baltic, Russia and NATO, these larger relationships, we also ought to think about how this all interplays in different fora, because there could be lessons for us in this and uh, messages in the way that we should be you know, thinking more uh, in a different perspective about how to deal with Russia in this complex of relationships. So Mark, uh, earlier this week before I flew here, I was talking with the proverbial senior U.S. official and asked this person, where do you think Putin might lash out next if he does? I said Baltics, Georgia, Moldova, Kazakhstan has been mentioned by some analysts. And this person responded by saying, don't rule out elsewhere in the Middle East, Libya, Lebanon, even Yemen. If you had to put money on this, if you thought Putin was going to lash out again, your money, not mine, um, <laughs> where would you say this might play out? OK. Um, let me start by actually picking up on, on, on what Fiona was saying um, in terms of sort of the general worldview um, of, of the Russians. Because I think it's really important to stress one point. As, I mean, I've just, just come back from I spent the last uh, four months in, in Moscow. And the striking thing is how Everything is about Washington, ultimately. Everything else is just how it connects in some ways to Washington. So even China's strategy is as much as anything else because America is being nasty to us. And we can use China as a way of, of, of getting around that, whether it's financially or geostrategically. Likewise, in Europe, as we all know, um, you know everyone here in Europe is essentially a cat's paw of the United States. <laughs> um, busy doing its own geopolitics. But again, the function of Europe in much of, of that in, in Russia's worldview is how we can use Europe against the United States. So in this extraordinarily Washington-centric, self-delusively Washington-centric sort of worldview, well, that's the way of thinking about these interventions often. I mean, you know, Kiev, it, the Donbass was about the fear that we're going to lose Ukraine, as if Ukraine was ever Russia's to, to, to win or lose. Syria, 
is not about Assad, it's not about Islamic State, it's about how we can get the Americans to be talking to us again. So one answer to, well, where might, might Russia go next is, where does Russia think that it could do something that both is within its capacities? And we've got to realize that actually, although the Syrian operation caught us by surprise, not just in terms of the actual launch of it, but how effectively it was handled. I think we all had assumptions that very quickly Russian planes would start falling out of the skies because you know, technicians had forgotten to fuel, refuel them or whatever. They've actually done better than anticipated. But still, Russia has very limited long-range power projection capacities. So I, I would say that if I was going to um, start putting, and I would, would much rather put your money, but if, if I had to put my money down on, on an intervention, I, I think we're, we're talking about one of, one of two situations. Um, it, it, it's going to be opportunistic rather than strategic for a start. It's actually a situation that arises rather than a cunning chess move where they worked out that eight moves from now they're going to be able to do it because that's not the way the Russians are, are working. Um, and it will be somewhere where they think that they can, they can use a, a low impact, sorry, a, a, a low cost, high impact mm -hmm. intervention. They don't really have much. They, they are now stuck in Syria, that drawdown that actually was really just a reprofiling. Um, you know, I think has demonstrated that. I don't see them having lots of extra capacity. So, so they'll, they'll, they'll be wanting to find some way in which they can actually think there's going to be a good um, return for them. Which means that I don't think, for example, I, no one wants them in Yemen. No one wants them in Libya. There's nothing really that they can obviously do. It's if a situation arises, if, if instability arises, where they think they, they actually can, can then use it as a chip. And I don't currently see that except in Afghanistan. Mm. For me, Afghanistan is one of the interesting areas. It's one that, again, <coughs> it's, it, it's been fascinating. I, you know, way back, um, <coughs> mists of time, I did my doctorate on the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, the interesting thing is talking to people from, from you know, whom I spoke to in, during my time of my research, who are now actually relatively senior within the Ministry of Defense, Foreign Affairs, academic community, and so forth. I get the feeling that a lot of Afghan expertise is currently being dusted off and they're reminding themselves of what actually can be done. I'm not talking about 150,000 troops going across the border. I'm just talking about the sense that maybe with airstrikes here, targeted interventions there. So Afghanistan is one. But the other one I'll just mention very briefly is I think that we're not necessarily talking about kinetic means. Um, I think it's much more likely that we're not going to see another Donbass or similar, or let alone a Crimea. These are all, all one-offs. But again, I think trying to find places in which they can inject themselves politically really to be bought off. Because that is essentially, it, it is the geopolitics of extortion um, which are currently in play. So they want to be in a position where they can just simply say, we're, we're stirring up a bit of trouble, but on the other hand, we could, we could just back away tomorrow if someone makes it worth our while. Carl, it, th there's a narrative out there that Putin is this decisive leader who takes action, intervened in Syria, <coughs> saved Assad, he's winning, we're losing. First, do you uh, buy any of that? And second, do, do you see Putin as this strategist who has a vision for either restoring the former Soviet Union, for returning Russia to the top of the stage, or is he a tactician opportunist filling in some voids that we, in fact, might be leaving in places like Syria? I think he clearly sees himself as a leader to restore the greatness of Russia, not the Soviet Union, but Russia. It, it is, as was pointed out earlier, it's more the 19th century. Uh, he would like to be the Peter the Great or the Catherine the Great, although she had some problem with the Crimean War, I understand. <laughs> um, but but it, it's more in that league. It, does he have a grand strategy for how to do it? I doubt. Um, but he's worried about the strength of Russia, the uh, unity of Russia. I'm, I'm amazed by how many times we can hear them saying that the West is plotting to break up Russia. I mean, they actually say that. And, and they've said it so many times that one starts to suspect that some people actually believe it. Um, so that, I think, is, uh, is where he is. If I could just make one comment on Syria when it comes into this, why he didn't intervene? Well, clearly, playing with Americans. The big boys know how to do these things. Americans have cruise missiles, I have cruise missiles, they can bomb, I can bomb. Uh, we are the guys. Um, <laughs> that particular element was strong. But another element should not be underestimated, that goes to what I said before. He's against regime change. The fall of a regime 
that is friendly to Moscow is not acceptable. So the fall of Assad falls into the entire category of against regime change. And I think it should be seen in the context of another area as well. I, I was fascinated when I was in Moscow recently and there was an ex-military Russian who said to me, did you notice which Air Force units we sent to Syria? To which I had to confess I didn't think about that specifically. He said, well, look at the bases. Those are the ones that we are preparing for operation in Central Asia. Uh, because there could be scenarios down the road where we see the threat of regime change coming in Central Asia. And now these particular units, they got good training for how you can prevent that. But that goes to your Afghanistan point. I thought it was interesting when you had the Russia NATO Council now and had all sorts of issues on the agenda. And the issue that the Russians wanted to put on the agenda, the only one I understand, was Afghanistan. Um, and that sort of regime change, stability of Russia, or against regime change in the periphery, stability of Russia, and then they are prepared to take whatever action is needed. And there, I think, he is unpredictable, ruthless, and determined. So, Harinder, we're getting a little closer geographically to <laughs> India, talking about Central Asia, Afghanistan. Uh, how, how do you see the situation there playing up, including competition between China and Russia in this region? You know, in fact, uh, funnily enough, Russia and China, they're collaborating on Central Asia, which could, I mean, Central Asia could become a bone of contention between the two. But right now, apart from the uh, geostrategic aspect, there's also the geoeconomic aspect, which both of them are. Uh, exploring the possibilities of working together. And this is the so-called Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative, which the Central Asian republics have uh, uh, taken to uh, very nicely and in a very positive way, because I think they feel that it means a lot of connectivity, corridors coming in through Central Asia, linking them up the, to the Middle East and West Asia, the landlocked Central Asian republics would be in a position to uh, export their oil and gas and natural resources. So Russia is definitely looking at Central Asia. But I think West Asia, uh, or the Middle East, as you know, you all call it, is <laughs> an area which uh, Russia is definitely interested in, because it sees uh, the US kind of uh, withdrawing from that region. Uh, you know, like the US interest because of shale gas and other discoveries. Uh, the US uh, is not really committed, and as the Obama administration is also in election mode. So this is where Syria was, uh, Syria is one. He, uh, Putin was very critical of what happened in Libya. So they feel that this is a potential um, threat because Russia is majorly also worried about uh, terrorism, and the, you know, the Chechen rebels and all forming a common cause. So that is Putin's very real worry. Terrorism worries them when you speak with Russian diplomats and officials uh, back and forth or when you travel to Moscow. So terrorism is something, and they feel that Afghanistan, but in Afghanistan, Russia does not want to, I mean, that is something they would like to forget. It's very much like India does not want to remember 1962 and China. Russia does pretty much the same. They do not talk much about Afghanistan, but Central Asia, yes. Uh, and they talk of more the geoeconomic connect with Central Asia. And I think this could eventually, uh, this is actually maybe designed to keep any US designs um, for the future at bay and uh, to check them. And that is why probably they encourage China to get into Central Asia. Let me, let me stick with you for a second and ask you about BRICS, which some of the BRICS seem to be falling out of right. BRICS. Um, Brazil, we know what's happening there. It should be an interesting Olympics. Um, <laughs> South Africa, President Zuma is, is swallowed up in corruption investigations. Um, you have China, uh, obviously a concern for India and then you have uh, Russia. Russia. So BRICS, is it sort of dying dead, or is there a future there? Uh, we've got the next BRICS summit happening in India, in Goa, in September. All five countries are committed to keep the BRICS initiative going. Uh, each one is committed to uh, kind of revive it, despite problems. And uh, there is never any talk of BRICS dying down as such. 
Uh, we all have problems. India has huge domestic problems about corruption and everything. But I think what helps us is that we are still a vibrant democracy. And that keeps us going, and we are a very big market. So despite everything, you know that the reforms will happen. You have to create employment. Similarly, um, the feeling in India is that despite the problems which uh, Brazil is having, uh, economically, I think whoever comes would be committed to BRICS because it just gives you a forum mm -hmm. uh, against the G20 and things like that. So none of the five are really going to let the BRICS initiative peter out. India, Russia, and China also do a smaller RICS, the Russia-India-China dialogue, which has been kind of a, a very low-key kind of an engagement because of tensions between um, India and China, though we are now trying to integrate more closely with China economically. Uh, with Russia again, because Russia had com has completely collapsed. And that is something which they want to revive with India. Uh, you know, like in fact, Putin, when uh, in December, Prime Minister Modi went to Russia for the annual uh, dialogue, the strategic dialogue, it was that Russia would be willing to revive some of our own, uh, you know, the Soviet era obsolete factories which were set up in India for the manufacture of the MiG-21s and do something like a make in India which fits in with Modi's vision. Mm -hmm. So RICS is not happening, but BRICS, uh, I'm not too pessimistic about it because uh, each government does have their domestic compulsions and limitations, but I think collectively they are kind of uh, uh, committed to taking this movement forward. Um, Mark, let me make a statement and get your reaction. Putin regime. It's like a mafia, it's kleptocratic, it's ruthless, it'll do anything to stay in power, as Carl said, terrified of regime change. Um, it'll invade neighbors if necessary. As the economic situation deteriorates, it looks for distractions, deflections of attention. Um, agree, disagree? Um, again, I'll have to be the, oh, let's, let's insert some yours there. Who invited this you're, you're exactly, <laughs> entirely pointless. Look, I think, in a way, if we look at the Putin regime, I think it's important to stress that in some ways there are two Putin regimes. There is Putin himself and a relatively small handful of people who are close to him, who definitely, I think, have, have changed. I mean, Putin in presidential term three is very different from the Putin whom we saw in presidential terms one and two. In his earlier incarnations, he talked very tough on nationalism and so forth, and clearly, as we saw in the extraordinarily brutal Chechen war and, and elsewhere, I mean, he was willing to act on it. But he was also deeply pragmatic, and I did think, do think that he actually saw Russia's future as being in some ways integrated with the West. Not a Western-style democracy, but some kind of, call it say, strategic partnership of sorts. Now we see a very different Putin, for whatever reasons, and the last thing I want to do is to cry, try and crawl inside his head. But one way or the other, he absolutely now seems to be committed to this historic mission of, as he sees it, so not just the regathering of, of the Russian lands, which is his first task, but actually now making Russia great again. Doesn't that sound familiar? Um, so there is this ideological commitment, which I think, as it were, is one that he's willing to sacrifice not just the interests of ordinary Russians, but actually Russia's short-term interests. There's no way at the moment that one can get away from the fact that empire costs and he's willing to accept those costs in the name of, if not empire, that this is this kind of resurgent Russia. However, the majority of the people, in my opinion, within the Russian elite are not like that. They are the, the pragmatic kleptocrats. They just want to be free to steal. And then to go and buy agreeable apartments in the West and send their kids to universities in the West and travel and all those kind of things, for whom actually the Putin project is very, very bad for business. And therefore, I think we are beginning to see some degree of tensions within the regime about, well, what kind of regime do we want to be? Just an amiable kleptocrats who, let's face it, the West is comfortable dealing with. We, do, we have no problem dealing with kleptocrats. We'll, we'll criticize them, but we'll take their money. Thank you very much. Or the driven nationalist ideologists who are currently in charge. So my view is, look, yes, what you have said accurately describes Putin and his inner circle, except up to the kleptocracy point. Yes, a lot of these are kleptocrats, but that's not the primary driver, in my opinion. Then there's also a different, as it were, almost P Putinism light, Putinism 1.0, post-Putinism, whatever you want to call it, but a, a, a kleptocratic and pragmatic body who represent the majority of the elite, but just not the most powerful ones at the moment. So Fiona, as is, is you look at the reaction 
the Western reaction to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. NATO is beefing up its forces uh, in the Baltic states, Poland, uh, some would argue not enough, but certainly there's a huge change from where things were pre-2014. Um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as the invasion of Georgia, has had this reaction among other neighboring states of sort of uh, repelling them, not luring them in. Is Putin, in fact, digging his own grave through this? And if so, what does that mean for the West? Is he digging his own grave? Well, Perhaps I mean, he, he might, I, yes, he might be doing that in different ways, actually. Um, you know, but because look, I, I mean, just picking up on something that Mark has said, there's a different kind of trap that I think that uh, Putin um, has created for himself, uh, for the Russian system and for anybody who comes after him. Because we, all we're talking about is Putin. Mm. And we wouldn't have been doing that uh, before 2011 and 2012 during the tandem uh, with Medvedev. You know, we, we liked seeing Medvedev around and we were actually, you know, Medvedev was talking about a new perestroika, there was a kind of a sense of pluralism in the system. Putin himself said it was dangerous to have all of power in the hands of one man, even if it was his hands. And the whole idea of creating the tandem was to try to kind of create some, you know, uh, safeguards in the system in case, you know, heaven forbid, Putin fell headfirst off a stage and that was the end of that. The problem is now what happens um, in that system if that indeed um, uh, transpires. And that's the real kind of trap. There's a grave that is being dug for Russia of incredible instability and uncertainty. We're spending an awful lot of time thinking about where's the next Mr. Putin? Where's the next successor? What happens to this system? So that's kind of uh, one thing that's happening. Now, the other um, set of um, questions here that you're implying and the way that you formulated that is about Russia's larger relations with everyone else. And we do see, and as Harinda is you know, pointing out, and the, the reference that I made to Putin with Abe and, uh, and Japan, um, is Russia running around a lot right now trying to shore up relationships? Definitely. Because there is certainly a great deal of realization that they've really messed up a lot of relationships. Not to say that we don't do that too, but what has happened uh, with uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, what happened with the invasion of Georgia in 2008, is they've scared all of the neighbors um, on a rather you know, colossal scale. They've lost the hearts and minds. Now, I don't think they were ever in the business of getting the hearts and minds. The, the whole um, point was really to just uh, make sure, as Mark is pointing out, that um, if, if Russia makes a threat, you know that they will follow through with it. And the benefit of not uh, doing what they're telling you not to do is not having the threat applied. But that's not how you kind of uh, basically build up long-term relationships. There's very much the, the short-term uh, cost to this. So uh, I think we're seeing uh, all of the evidence that the, they have processed, they have uh, dug a grave for themselves in terms of foreign policy, and that the imperative now is to find other relationships, trying to find a way of uh, maneuvering the Japanese into a different place, trying to find relationships with India that will uh, create uh, long-term opportunities, because you've kind of spoiled all the relationships apart from the relationships of fear with your immediate neighbors, and you've headed down that path with actually some of your closest Western interlocutors, Germany, the European Union, you know, we've seen the end of modernization partnerships. It's not just uh, with the rupturing of the relationship with the United States. So I think this is gonna play out in a major way. So there's the Putin trap uh, that is created of the hyper-personalization of the Russian presidency. And then there's, you know, as you had termed it, the kind of grave that you have dug for yourself in terms of your foreign policy that also have to be addressed, irrespective of how you handle things now. So, Carl, as you look at it, do you see examples or patterns or trends where Putin is pursuing Russia's national interests versus his own and his regime's interests? I mean, if, if you look at Syria, power projection, but as Mark said, may rue the day. Ukraine has not gone terribly well, but at terrible cost to Ukrainians. Where, where is he advancing Russia's national interests? Well, I think he's, I don't think that he would understand that particular question at all. Um, so well, I'm let's quite, ask him, let's go to yeah, the So I'm not quite certain the question is that relevant because I mean, he sees himself as Russia, uh, as the Russian leader, as the one who's gonna save, make Russia great again, as you said, with all of the attributes of personality saying those sorts of things. That's, that's where he is. And, 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 and prepared to, as we said, be very ruthless in the 
exercise of that particular mission. Uh, but I also think, as has been indicated here, that uh, that's the beginning of, I wouldn't call it nervousness, but uncertainty of where this is leading and, and, and relations with others and not things going particularly well. I go back a couple of years. Uh, we heard a lot about the Eurasian Economic Union or whatever it was called. Um, and there was even sort of Western leaders who said, oh, we have to interact with this particular thing because it's going to be big and powerful. It's nearly disappeared. Uh, because one of the effects of what's been happening is the relationship with both Minsk and, and Astana is not particularly ideal any longer because they don't particularly like what they see coming out of the Kremlin. A couple of years ago, almost immediately after Crimea, we heard a lot about we don't really care about the West uh, because we've got China and there's going to be this fantastic relationship with China. Haven't really heard very much about that. Uh, because the Chinese are interested in strong economies and things like that, and they don't really see Russia in that particular league. Um, so I've, the mood over there is not as jubilant as, uh, as it was a couple of years ago, but he identifies, and that, that's why I think he will now focus on, I think, the presidential election, 2018, that's important for him. Um, I think he's going to win it. Are you betting Mark's <laughs> money on that? <laughs> no, I'm not betting too much money. But, but I'm, 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 I'm still surprised by how, how much they are focused on an election that they are absolutely certain to win. Uh, but they need to manage it without new instability. And then I think the really interesting period is going to be the period from 2018 to 2024, when his... Um, Military modernization is starting to produce more impressive results than we've seen so far, and where the lack of economic modernization mm. uh, is going to set in really in terms of social uh, and other indicators. That's going to be how he handles the balance between bread and spectacle in that particular period is going to be unsettling, I think. So, Rinda, let me ask you, and correct me if I'm wrong, India, as far as I know, has not imposed any sanctions on Russia. Uh, in, for the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, trade between the two countries has been increasing. Could you envision an action, a step by Putin, that would force India's leaders to step back and say, wait a minute, perhaps we don't want to be associated. I mean, we're the largest democracy in the world. Uh, associating with Putin, not such a good idea. Uh, firstly, trade with Russia has been declining. India-Russia trade. Corrected. Uh, it has been declining. It's nowhere near the Soviet days. And this is what Putin, when he's, uh, he came to India uh, last year, and when uh, Modi went, he's willing to make certain compromises to move certain weapons platforms because no private Indian businessman wants to go to Russia and put his money over there. Gone are the days of the rupee-ruble exchange, which saw a lot of robust trade between India and the Soviet Union. And um, so what is happening is government, uh, the government of India, the two governments, you know, they want to make each other feel very good about it. So these are government to government enterprises. Uh, we've not had a very good uh, experience with the refurbished uh, uh, aircraft carrier which the Russians uh, uh, sent to us, the Gorchkov. Uh, it went beyond schedule, the budgets went haywire. But Putin now, in an attempt to woo the Indian market, last year in October, a Russian Chamber of Commerce delegation came to New Delhi looking for investments. And apart from the farmer sector, nothing really happened. So if India were to even impose sanctions on Russia, uh, India does not get impacted, and India will not do it for political reasons, because uh, there is no direct clash of interest between India and Russia. But when it came to Ukraine, uh, there was a very bland statement which was neither here nor there made by a national security, then national security advisor, Shiv Shankar Menon, who said that uh, the legitimate interests of all, that is the people, the different segments of the uh, Ukrainian population, should be uh, taken into consideration and should be safeguarded. And then he tried to modify that statement because the Indian media can also be ruthless. You know, in a democracy, you know what it's like. And uh, so, the, so he said legitimate Russian interests and legitimate other interests. But what the West picked up was only legitimate Russian interests in Ukraine. But India 
does stand committed to the interests of the minorities. We are very sensitive to these unilateral actions and border disputes and, uh, uh, you know, uh, because since we have inherited this after uh, independence in 1947, we've inherited this leg legacy of disputed borders, both with Pakistan and with China. So we are very sensitive to this and to the interests of the minorities because this is something which India grapples with on a daily basis. And um, I mean, I'm not quoting uh, anybody high up, but what we heard was uh, that between Russia and uh, India, when the officials meet, um, Putin was asked that the Ukraine action uh, was something India was finding it difficult to uh, support or to kind of um, approve of. This was a message which was conveyed to uh, the Russian uh, officially. But this was in a very bilateral, soft kind of a way. And uh, the other thing is, you know, when uh, I think what you raised earlier, I, it just brings to mind, um, thus Putin, I think what you had asked the others, uh, when P Putin, I think we have to uh, read his speeches. He's very good at making speeches. He justified 18th March 2014, he justifies his uh, uh, annexation of Crimea and the attack on Ukraine. Similarly, when he became uh, the president in uh, 2000, his speech says that Russia's territorial integrity is non-negotiable. And his uh, very affirmative actions now over the last two years have actually sent his ratings soaring domestically. Now, for how long are people going to put up with all this uh, hardship, the economic hardship and the sanctions? I think he would like the sanctions to get lifted. Even with the West, he's negotiating. And, uh, but with India, I think, uh, that you know, it's never going to be such a shrill kind of a uh, situation because we really don't have no strategic uh, differences between India and Russia. So before we go to the audience, let me ask each of you, what should we do? Tighten sanctions, beef up the defenses of, of countries in the region, uh, military lethal assistance to Ukraine, um, or return to business as usual. We've been at this stalemate long enough. Or go after corruption, uh, something, Mark, you've written about uh, quite a bit. Fiona, let me, let me start with you. Look, there's elements of all of those things that we should be considering. And actually, um, there's one thing that I want to highlight on the going after corruption, which uh, she should give us some pause and for um, you know, kind of really thinking ahead. The Spanish prosecutors have just um, issued some pretty serious indictments that have mm -hmm. been a good decade in, in the making um, for um, uh, Russian involvement in uh, organized crime in, uh, inside Spain. I'm sure Mark can um, uh, shed some uh, light on uh, that one as well. We have actually some very powerful tools, tools at our own disposal. We never use and never think about this because we're always sort of thinking about the old instruments and old approaches. And one of this is just basically putting into practice our own regulations, our own law enforcement, and our own procedures against anti-money laundering. We would be, as we've seen from the Spanish prosecutor's office, as we see from New York uh, prosecution, which has un unearthed all kinds of uh, nefarious activity, uh, we actually have an awful lot of powerful instruments that we could deploy in different ways. So I think we have to think outside the box. The other thing that we should be doing, and, and again, I'm really pleased that Harinda is here, is thinking much more broadly about the whole complex of Russia's relationships and how we can actually change the calculus. Because we're not just going to change it by just thinking about NATO, the uh, Baltic security and Ukraine, and then also Syria. We have to really think about how Russia interacts and what the vulnerabilities are and concerns elsewhere. And it's obvious, as you're pointing out, that everyone will have a very different way of approaching Russia. But there's different ways of, uh, as I said, of changing this calculus. So I think we have to look at Russia as this multi-regional uh, state that it is and to think about where the other vulnerabilities are and where there are other points of leverage and pressure that we might not be, um, we're not be using effectively. There's Russia in the Arctic, there's the Asia Pacific. Russia's actually very concerned about its own positions in these other areas. And we have to show them in many respects about how this might have negative consequences for uh, other core interests of Russia. So I think we have to think outside the box and be much more inventive and uh, much more focused uh, on our approaches. Yes, let me just sort of pick up on that, really, and sort of move it forward. In terms of, yes, of course, there are things that can and should and are being done in terms of military deterrence and such like, 
moving forces in, into the Baltic states is an excellent move. As much as anything else, or more than anything else, for the, for the political rather than these purely war-fighting reasons. But in general terms, I'm, he, here we are, we, we, we get very het up about hybrid war, which isn't hybrid war, but anyway, non-kinetic ways of Russian aggression, destabilization, and so forth. The thing is, we often lose sight of the fact, first of all, that as far as the Russians are concerned, hybrid war is a, is a Western invention. I mean, the very fact they call it Gibrid Voina, they haven't even got their own name for it. But more to the point, how immensely powerful we are in all of these non-kinetic measures. So, for example, I mean, heading on to this business of, of, of precisely sort of fighting corruption, look, this is a regime which has become almost completely deinstitutionalized. Every single structure has essentially been hollowed out. Um, yes, of course, they exist, but purely as, as managerial structures. The, the, the Ministry of Defense, you, you, you talk to people within there, and they know full well that they, not even Shoigu, actually is a key decision maker. Likewise, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they have seen the shrinking of Lavrov into this rather depressing sock puppet for the Kremlin, whereas once upon a time, he was a true you know, figure of weight within the decision-making system. It's, some, it's become entirely personalized. Mm -hmm. And that is problematic and destabilizing. It is also an opportunity, because precisely it is the people, the individuals and the individual's interests. This is why, for example, when we had the first rounds of sanctions post-Crimea, which were, which were hitting individuals, in my opinion, they were, that was a far, far more effective and imaginative measure than the falling back on the kind of structural sanctions which we adopted because we know them, we understand them, they're, 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 they're relatively easy. And which essentially hit ordinary Russians, the Russian economy, mm -hmm. rather than the people who actually make the decisions. The, the people who matter are willing to fight their imperial war to the last Omsk truck driver. <laughs> Um, as long as they still have all the perks and the joys uh, of, their, of their lives. So, I mean, I, I, I think we actually we, we need to be thinking in terms of how we can mobilize our own soft and hybrid power, and to do that for two purposes, really. And, and this is a political decision. How far it's simply about leave us be, stop messing in our neighborhood, stop sort of causing trouble, stop trying to in, in, inter interfere, and basically, do what you want to do at home within the bounds of, of international of law and such like. But basically speaking, if you want to steal at home, steal at home. But don't come and sort of bring your, 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 your miseries in, in, into our sphere of influence. And then we have to decide quite what we think of, of, of Ukraine or whatever. Or how far it is that, in fact, we need to be thinking about, well, how do we, and this is a, a deliberately loaded term, house train the Russian regime how far we actually have to teach them new laws of engagement with the outside world. Now, that's a, a big political decision that is way above that of a pay grade of, 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 of a humble, well, not very humble, academic, um, <laughs> stand, sort of sit, sitting on a panel. But I think this is my last point. The point is we need to decide what we want, because for me, I, that is one of the most catastrophic voids, is some consensus notion within the West of quite what we want from this situation. We're wholly responsive. Carl, uh, Europeans return to business as usual. Are they going to renew sanctions next month, and or is this? I don't. For... I don't think so. But uh, you, you don't think what? Sorry. You don't think what? That they're going to renew sanctions next month. You do not think they will renew sanctions. I don't. I think we'll see a rollover of sanctions. Um, I'm sorry. No, wait a minute. We're talking yeah. past each other. <laughs> when the EU meets next month. Yeah. They will roll. They will renew rollover yeah. sanctions. Okay, just yeah. to be clear. Yeah. I mean that's that's my expectations, and that's the sort of the. If I read the tea leaves, that's that's yeah. the way they look at the moment. And uh, overall, uh, I'd like to say that I think we are doing that badly. Um, NATO is going to do things, as you said. It could be more. It could be somewhat different. But but things are changing in a rather fundamental way, on the military postures and the military preparedness. The sanctions are having, they are not massive. We don't have any trade sanctions against Russia, really. Uh, but they're sanctions that have a political and also technological and other effects. And they will continue. Um, and, and, and we are supporting Ukraine. I belong to those who believe it could do more. But as a matter of fact, Ukraine, contrary to expectations in Moscow, has not collapsed, will not collapse. 
and I think there are quite a number of people in Moscow are starting to see that they have, they've lost Ukraine. Mm. Uh, that's not a small thing in historical terms. They've lost Ukraine. Uh, so we, are, we aren't doing that badly, uh, even if we could do even better, I have to say. Um, the problems that we have is, as I said previously, I think the unity of the West, which is the thing. As long as we stay together, and even if our policies are only half perfect, we're going to be fairly okay. Uh, the problems that we have now is a problem in June, which could be catastrophic, and it's a problem in November, which could be semi-catastrophic, uh, because those two events could sort of undermine the unity of the West and undermine quite a lot of the other things that we are doing where we are on track, and then open up for opportunities for a Russian regime that feels that it's under threat. And that could be a uh, theme for panel debate at next MIRI conference. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the audience, as I expected. There are a lot of hands up. Um, unless you're the president of Estonia, please introduce yourself uh, before <laughs> your question. Uh, yes, I'm Thomas Hermes. Uh, Thank just, you. Just for, um, I mean, we've talked about all these actions on the part of Russia and the, from the military sense, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I just like to hear what people think about uh, their uh, their rather successful courting of uh, populist right and cent right and I mean hard right and hard left groups in Europe, and we also see even in the United States we have a presidential candidate who thinks he can do business. Uh, we see you know, AfD <coughs> joining together with uh, the Linke. Though someone might say that the link aren't that great. But in general, I mean, you look across the board in Europe and you see populist right-wing movements that right now enjoy, you know, 20 to 30 percent support. I mean, Marine Le Pen probably is the most, who certainly would like to dismantle NATO and uh, pull France out of the EU and do a deal with the country that is giving her money, nine billion, a million. Is, uh, so, I mean, that seems also to be something that's going on. I don't know, I'd just like to hear what you think of that. I, I, I just have doubts about the spontaneity of this uh, Russophilia on the part of the hard right and sort of a, a spontaneous love of homophobia and, uh, and Christianity by people who never were very religious before. All right, I'm gonna collect a few here because there were a lot of hands. Remember that. <clears throat> uh, uh, yesterday, uh, pre President Ilves was talking about the Francis Fukuyama dream. I think at this uh, panel, we can probably add one more dream. Uh, it will be, uh, with all due respect, Carl Bildt slash Fiona Hill dream. Uh, so, Carl, you were talking about the, some kind of the cohesion of the West or some kind of united West. Seems to me it's like a dream, and it is not. Uh, the attitude in the U.S. Uh, towards Russia is very different from attitudes in Georgia. U.S. does not see Russia as an existential threat. U.K. does not see. France does not see. Germany does not see. Georgia, Ukraine, Estonia have a quite different attitude. Mm -hmm. So that is why mm -hmm. West is already fragmented. It is not tomorrow. It is today. So that is why United West is a dream at the moment. Fiona, you were talking about the multi-regional Russia, but Russian regions do not wage foreign wars. Orenburg does not wage war in Syria. I meant, Pre I meant Russia no, 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 I, in I, multiple I understand, regions. Yes. I didn't mean... Right, that yeah. So all. that is yeah. why what we're really having, very united Kremlin right. and very fragmented West. Yeah. And that's probably one of the most important reasons for Russia's wars. That's a topic of these particular sessions. And it looks like as long as the situation continues, we would have Russia's wars in future, and we'll have panels on this topic in future Leonard Mary's conference. It's not a question, it's a cold observation. I took it as that. <laughs> so um, my question is, how do we get a more comprehensive view of the uh, interaction between Russia and the West. And let me explain. We have a very, very powerful weapon that Putin is extremely aware of, as is China. Ronald Reagan created it in the National Endowment for Democracy. It is, it is uh, the leadership 
of a whole range of non-governmental organizations which teach things like um, how to monitor uh, elections and how to look out for human rights and so forth. This is absolutely subversive mm -hmm. to Russia and China. And yet, we never talk about it in our NATO uh, colloquiums. We talk about politics, we talk about the military, but they see an assault coming on them. On the other hand, what they respond with is the economic levers of power, which we don't have any observation of. Case in point, the Silk Road project by China. So a China energy fund is going to put $7 billion into Romania. They're going to buy a refinery. They're then going to run a network of retail stations across Europe. Mm -hmm. To China, this is power. To Europe and the United States, this is just a, mm, what kind of a business transaction is this? So the state <laughs> security organization in Romania has blocked this. Now, the question you were asking, David, was where's the next intervention? Uh, well, why would the state security organization of Romania <clears throat> block a $7 billion plus investment in their country? On whose instructions? didn't come from the United States, so far as we can determine. So who would have an interest in disrupting that transaction? So when we're trying to figure out who's intervening where and what's the next step, I just uh, hope that we can take a more comprehensive view. This is very difficult for us because we don't have a good view of what NGOs are doing, and we don't have a good view of what the business relationships are that are working back and forth. But these are very, very powerful forces. It's a question. Yep. How do we do better? Okay. Keep track of all of these because we have a lot of hands and we're going to try to get through. Judy. Thank you, Judy. Judy Dempsey, Carnegie Europe. Uh, Judy, I, um, maybe stand oh, yeah, up if yeah, you sure. could um, so you can see better. This, this is called Russia's Wars, but I think it's um, an unfinished war, an unfinished business in Russia itself, which really wasn't addressed, and it's the North Caucasus. Mm -hmm. And we have seen over the past couple of months what has taken place in Dagestan, a complete radicalization even of the modest uh, Islamic groups there. We've seen so many fighters go off to Syria and ISIS. We've seen the, ex the, the huge authoritarian uh, situation in Chechnya. And my question to the panel is, surely this is one of the wars that Putin has to avert or to deal with? It, with your indulgence, I'm going to keep collecting some just because we have a lot of hands. So. Uh, go here, Char Radek and Yuri. Charles Hillman is pastor and active Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Um, uh, Russia wars, I agree not hybrid, full spectrum, at least using a wide range of tools. Uh, one of which we touched on last night, which is refugees. Um, Russia did a rather nice proof of concept on this to Finland uh, earlier, year, uh, starting a refugee flow, saying we have known nothing about this. Putin graciously intervened, refugee flow stopped immediately. Do you see this as something Russia can replicate broadly in Europe or elsewhere, elsewhere uh, as a tool of power? Just pass influence? it, three down, we'll get Radek in. Oh, right here, right, sorry, I gave you one already. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I love uh, Radek Sikorski, um, a senior fellow at Harvard, formerly uh, foreign minister of Poland. Um, I love the stuff about Russia feeling insecure, and it's real enough. But from the point of view of uh, Russia's neighbors, I'm reminded of, um, of an anecdote we used to have in the old days. Namely, what is the secure border of the Soviet Union? <laughs> yes. A secure border of the Soviet Union is a border that has Soviet soldiers on both sides of it. <laughs> uh, give it give it to Putin for playing a weak hand rather well. This is a country which, depending on the exchange rate, has an economy of between Holland and uh, Italy. 15% of the United States, 7% of NATO, 5% of uh, the West, if you add Japan. Uh, Japan. Um, and therefore, it is in the long run, un uh, 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 in the longer um, term, unsustainable. And I agree with Carl that it will come to a crisis. And the question is, who will get hurt in the meantime? Mm -hmm. And the question was, uh, and here I, I come to my conclusion, where, would he, where might he lash out next mm -hmm. to um, lift the numbers again? Mm -hmm. 
I would be very worried if I were, if I were the leader of Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a country that has assets. Uh, it would have uh, a uh, positive, from Russia's point of view, effect on commodity prices. This is a country with an unset uh, succession rules. And this is a country that might provoke Russia if it wanted to leave the, either the customs area or the uh, Euro-Asiatic uh, Union. And also, it's a country where Chinese influences uh, are rising. Mm -hmm. All right, Yuri, then Andrews, and then we'll, I'll, I, I will do my best to get to everybody. We just have a lot of hands. Uh, Yuri Luik, I see, yes. Uh, to continue on the same note uh, of, of Radek, I mean, is it for the West operationally important what the motives of Putin are? The fact that was mentioned several times that he feels insecure. What, what should we uh, sort of detect, detect from that uh, uh, reasoning? Because when the Baltic states were occupied, one of the reasons was Putin was afraid of Germany. When... Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry. Someone. I apologize. <laughs> Stalin was afraid yeah, yeah, yeah. of yeah, Germany. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Poland, I mean, obviously the Soviets were afraid that aggression would repeat itself. Uh, Afghanistan, they were clearly afraid, as they have told us uh, at that time, that the United States will somehow take over Afghanistan. So it's always like that. So the question is, what should be our operational kind of idea or looking from that point of view. Thank you. Anders Åslund, the Atlantic Council, uh, following up on uh, President uh, Ilves' uh, point, uh, dirty r Russian money, but uh, uh, corrupt uh, political and other forces uh, in Europe. So this is primarily for Carl Bildt since it's a European uh, question. In 1766, Sweden, for that reason, introduced the most uh, far-reaching uh, uh, public information act in the world. Uh, Denmark followed uh, five years later. Uh, to date, only the Nordic countries have such far-reaching uh, public uh, information acts, uh, which would effectively stop any Russian money from uh, uh, going into European politics. Isn't that time for the rest of Europe to catch up with the Nordic countries slightly more than 200 years later? Thank you. Um, I will come back to this side uh, in a few minutes after I show that I'm not discriminating against this side. Konstantin. Uh, Konstantin Eggert from Moscow. I have uh, a question to Harinder and a question to uh, Fiona. To Harinder, I mean, um, I kind of, I couldn't figure out what is the Indian attitude to uh, Putin's military and strategic posture? Uh, to me, it sounded a bit like we don't care, really. Uh, and um, I wonder where it also did you get this idea that um, uh, Russia somehow, somehow fragmented domestically? And I mean, I don't see that living there, but probably you do, so could you expand on that? And uh, to Fiona, a very simple question. Uh, the, United, the United States, as Mark correctly said, plays an enormous role in, in Russia. I mean, it, it's, it's enormously important what happens in Washington. So your prediction, uh, will, there be, will there be any similarity in terms of Russia policy between the potential Clinton administration and potential Trump administration, if you know? And uh, secondly, what could be expected essentially from uh, not only the political decision makers, but from the civil service military establishment in America with regard to uh, Russia in the coming years. Okay, right there. Philippe Herrera from the French Ministry of Defense. Pardon me. I wanted to come back to Russia's wars and ask the question of Russia's wars versus Putin's wars. What I mean by that is that, uh, as, as, um, as you've pointed out, the recent operations have been extraordinarily uh, played up vis-a-vis -vis Russian public opinion, the propaganda, the television, the chest thumping, being part of the big boys club, etc., etc. On the other hand, we've also seen extraordinary efforts to stifle and suppress information on casualties, on what's really taking place, which would give the indication that there is some sort of fear or nervosity 
uh, from Putin vis-a-vis -vis the way this plays out in public opinion. My question to, to, to you is, to what extent is this tension there between the, these two factors, and how does this factor in, in your view, uh, possible future calculations for Putin on Putin's wars so that he tries to make sure that they are Russia's wars? Yeah. Uh, Sergei Tsipliaev, St. Petersburg, Russia. From my opinion, it is a big overestimation outside and inside Russia, the influence and power of Mr. Putin. Uh, and there is a big underestimation of the ruined influence of so-called Silovikis. Mm -hmm. And sometimes now they are dictating what Mr. Putin must do. Some examples. Uh, the resignation of Mr. Serdikov. It was not a plan of Mr. Putin. The fight around Moscow regional casinos. Mm -hmm. And last evidence is the creation of the National Guard. Mm -hmm. Mr. Putin is not trusting to Silovikis. Mm -hmm. And all the time when we have Minsk, Parallel, Mr. Patrushev, the Secretary of the uh, Council of uh, uh, Security Council, was publishing interviews, especially in Russian official mass media, in Russian newspaper. And the main idea is that the uh, Ukraine is not the question. The Ukraine is a battlefield between the historical battle between Russia and West, heated by United States. And uh, when we are looking on all these wars, the main question uh, in all the times are some military reasons. Ukraine is the question about Sevastopol. Next day, we are losing Ukraine and NATO ships will stand in Sevastopol. It was the main argument. And Mr. Lovikis came to Mr. Putin and said, Mr. Putin, we are losing Sevastopol. Syria, Tartus. Uh, only one uh, document is signed now with uh, Assad, the unlimited agreement for uh, rent of Tartus and Khmeimim. And that means that it's also the main point. And then if we are coming to reinforcement of NATO, of sanctions, it supports the uh, approach of Silovikis and our population that we are sitting in the surrounding fortress. And looking back to, US, to USSR, uh, my question is, uh, is it possible now for West to formulate the strategy how to survive till the next modernization wave of perestroika uh, in Russia? Thank you. <coughs> Over here. Mm -hmm. uh, Jakub Kalinsky, East Stratcom, European External Action Service. I would like to come back to the first question. If uh, Russia is an existential threat, uh, you all said it isn't, and we already heard that maybe the Ukrainians and the Georgians do not see it the way. And uh, the argument for this being that we are, for example, militarily stronger, well, we were militarily stronger in 2008, and Georgia happened. We were stronger two years ago, and Crimea happened. So isn't it time to face the facts that uh, Putin overplays us with a much weaker hand and counteract it? Uh, great. Uh, sorry, Matt, and sure. right there. Sorry, okay. sorry. Uh, Matt Price, Atlanta Council, ICDS board. Um, picking up on Fiona's beautiful statement about the Russian invasion of Georgia. Eight years ago, that was not an accepted formulation. And maybe a lot of people in this room wanted to blame Saakashvili's government, maybe the U.S. government. In hindsight, how does it look now? Thank you. Uh, I'm George Shafflin, MAP for Hungary. Mark, two points to you. Could, could you First you of speak, all, we are talking about Russia. Yes, sorry, I'm speaking into the mic. Is it not coming through? Yeah, I couldn't yeah, hear. I, hear you. I don't okay, know. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, I'm George Shoplin, MEP for Hungary. Mark, two points to you. Russia's wars, it's almost exactly 100 years from the Brasilov Offensive. And I think what we're seeing in civilian sense is a repetition of probing attacks and the kind of defences that were eventually developed, I think, are the ones we should also be looking at. It comes back to your point about uh, geopolitical extortion. Second point also to you, you talked about the modern international system. You talked about the modern world. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that actually the modern world brought about by the West is now no longer in a unique position. It's actually challenged by other modernities. Russia is a part of it. I think we're going to be looking at a world of multiple modernities. And really the first step towards finding a position that actually is capable of resisting the incursions of other modernities is to accept that we no longer have a monopoly. All right, I'm, with apologies to everybody else, Natalie gets the last question and then we'll close with the panel. Um, Sorry. Thank you, very brief question on um, 
how do we build dialogue with Russia in, in all this context that you've, you've described? We have to deter Russia's wars. We have to be strict, as strict as possible with Putin and stand up for what we want to defend. But in the end, as Europeans here, we will not, our geography will not change. Russia is gonna be our, our neighbor and an important neighbor for years and years. I don't know if Putin will be in power uh, beyond or until 2024, but um, you know, what, how, what are your thoughts on how we actually offer that door or, or wangle it um, so that we don't give a system like Putin's the pretext to say there's just nothing out there apart from you know, hostility? Okay, so uh, apologies. I, actually, I, one more, real quick, if you can make it quick, because you did have your hand up for quite a while. Right here, if we can. I, I promise Rena will wrap up. Because <laughs> I'm hungry. Uh, uh, Ahmed Rashid, uh, I really think, you know, I mean, we've been missing out on one key element, and that is the American retreat from so many areas in the world, the creation of empty spaces, the fact is that once Putin realized the Americans would not intervene in Syria, he did. Uh, we're, we're hearing now that the uh, Russians want to take an interest in the Palestinian-Israeli issue, simply because the Americans have retreated from there. Likewise, the Americans have retreated from Central Asia. They're retreating from Afghanistan over the long term. We can well expect Russia to possibly intervene. Now, it doesn't intervene everywhere. It intervenes in places where its national interest is best served and where it will not have to face um, uh, the might of the American military. All right, thank you. So keep in mind you're standing between the audience and lunch. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, if you'd respond to any of the comments or questions, but keep it to two minutes each. So Harinda, you start. Yeah, there was a specific question addressed to me. Uh, one was on, uh, you know, like, I did not say that Russia is fragmented uh, domestically. What I said was Putin's actions and Russia's isolation have further strengthened his hands. And uh, despite the economic hardship, the people in Russia are willing to put up with those hardships and Putin's ratings have gone up. And it makes him act, it gives him the freedom to act in a particular manner. It's, it's got nothing to do with the fragmentation of uh, Russian uh, society or Putin has been able to unite. That was my uh, point which I'd made. Uh, and um, so they're willing to put up, but it remains to be seen as to for how long they will be able to put up with this economic uh, hardship because there's a patient, uh, you know, there's a patient's limit to everyone's patience. But what I could add to that is that uh, socially maybe, you know, initially about three or four years back, there was um, uh, a social revolution, like the pussycat revolution and all. Suddenly, we do not hear about that in Russia. And that is something I would like to hear from you about. And my, the second question you put to me was uh, India's attitude, we don't care. India very much cares. But India would, and this would be an issue which would come up if Russia's actions went for a UN vote. You know, if something comes up in the UN, uh, India would be uh, compelled to make a statement. But given our uh, long history of friendship with the Soviet Union and with Russia, India plays a very nuanced strategy over there, as do all other big powers. And one more general point somebody had raised about uh, what does the West do? Now, this is something which India also grappled with. We have an equally big or bigger China on our borders. We have a contested border with Pakistan. Uh, Japan, as uh, Fiona mentioned, um, uh, feels threatened by Chinese posturing in the Asia Pacific. So we do our own bilateral dialogues. And I think you've got the, the West is uh, lucky that you've got the NATO umbrella. And uh, there was this wonderful report which got released uh, yesterday, which talked about dialogue and building up deterrent capabilities. I think that should be a sustained uh, effort rather than showing that you know the EU is cracking under pressure, etc. I think that is the best way to go about it. As we do in the Asia Pacific, we have a hedging uh, strategy. We do not want to be left taking sides between US and China. Similarly, I think the West needs to take a call for its own security. Thank you. Carl. Just a couple of quick points. Um, first on 
dialogue with Russia. I think it's very important that even under these circumstances that we seek to develop the dialogue with primarily with Russian society, difficult as that is, because the Russian authorities are doing whatever they can to limit our possibilities in that respect, but we should do whatever we can. And also an official dialogue. I mean, Radek and Bigaudas and myself have been meeting with Russian officials for X numbers of years. It has an entertainment value. Um, uh, and it's a sporting event to a certain extent, uh, but it's worth doing. Uh, and I think there's a downside, as a matter of fact. I'm not quite certain it achieves that much, but there's a downside to not doing it. Uh, uh, and I think that's important. On President Dilva's question of uh, the funding of political parties and things like that, yep, that's going on. Whether it's particularly effective, I don't know. I'm more concerned with uh, the massive media operation and information operation that they're having. But here I think also that we are more aware of it now. We are starting to take countermeasures. Um, more should be done, but it's different from two years ago when very few people were aware of it. Now we are aware of it and we are taking countermeasures. And, and it should also make that qualification that if you look at what they are doing, they are not really fostering opinion. They want to foster opinion, but they are not succeeding in making opinion pro-Russian. If you look at the trends of opinion polling throughout Western Europe, it's moving in the other direction. Accordingly, they are concentrating on feeding the latent anti-American sentiment that is there and the latent anti brussel sentiment that is there. That's dangerous enough. And that goes to my basic point about the importance of the creation of, of the West. Briefly, the, re the refugee we weapon, as we saw them deploying first against Norway, uh, then against Finland, um, I think at the end of the day it backfired uh, because it made Norwegian and Finnish public opinion, if possible, even more <coughs> suspicious of Russian intentions. So the net gain for that particular operation I failed to see. I think it was from the Russian point of view a net loss. Final point on, um, uh, it was mentioned Caucasus or whatever, Chechnya. Um, what do we have in Chechnya? An extremely expensive ceasefire, I would say, from the Russian point of view, extremely expensive. He's bribed these mafioso types, um, and he's bribed them to the extent that they're building up a state. It's an independent, Muslim, semi-fundamentalist, militant state financed by the Russian state budget, and extending its power into Moscow and other places and threatening Russian interests. We haven't seen the end of that particular story, to put it mildly. Mark. OK, 16 questions, two minutes. Um, let one, me actually minute, just sort of actually. basically bring it down to three, three points that I think kind of wrap up a lot of issues. Absolutely, Russia's greatest asset has not been little green men or energy weapon or whatever, but it has been will. Mm -hmm. The capacity to, to act unconstrained by democratic accountability or anything like that, and also a willingness to break the rules, break the laws, and rely on our restraint. Um, and that has been very effective, but it's a wasting asset. Just as, let's say, after Crimea, you know, countries such as Estonia soon worked out, that, okay, well, it doesn't matter if you're wearing a badge on your sleeve or not. If you come over the border and you've got a gun, we'll shoot you. Um, generally speaking, th 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 they are playing a lot of cards that they can only play once. But nonetheless, I mean, that, that will, it's also worth mentioning, it therefore makes us think that we need to understand Russian governance and Russian decision-making processes. When, and this is where the issue of motive, to me, I think is important. It makes a difference if Russia wants to conquer the world <coughs> or if Russia wants the world to leave it be. It makes a way, a, a difference in terms of how we understand it, because only from how we understand it can we really resist it. Um, and this is why, I mean, I, I don't think that there's any kind of syllabic conspiracy as I mentioned in my ECFR paper, which came out this week, which you can download from the ECFR site, if you're so minded. Um, and it also, I think, links into public opinion. The, 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 you know, this is not... You know, if, you're in, if you're in Russia, you don't feel like you're in a mobilisation state. Actually, most Russians, sure, they're happy to see footage of their planes blowing up fundamentalists in Syria, whether they are or not is another matter. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that this is an imperialist public opinion. Quite the opposite. They're very concerned about, you know, how can they get food in their, in their fridge? And what kind of education is their kid going to have? You know, the Russian people are normal people, like everyone else. 
Um, so how do we actually kind of um, respond to that? And this is the last point. Well, look, we have to realize just how extraordinarily the Russians exploit our failures time and time again. Whether it's, and George, you're absolutely right in terms of not understanding how new modernities and new international structures are emerging. And I mean, yes, just as this whole, the whole leitmotif of this, of this conference is, is you know, about the new normal. Well, it is, it's gonna to have to be a new normal. We'll just have to define what kind of new normal it is. But also, you know, the best form of deterrence is not to be vulnerable and not mm -hmm. to be seen to be vulnerable. So this is why I think it's fantastically important that as far as possible, we target harden ourselves. And yes, that means making sure that it's harder for Russian intelligence to operate and stir up trouble, and that Russian dubious money can't flow with impunity, all these kinds of things. The reason why there's people willing to listen to Russia in, in the West is not because actually Russia offers a good model, it's because of a legitimacy gap, a credibility gap within the West that RT and all the other instruments gleefully exploit. We fix ourselves first. Fiona, last word. Well, I just want to amplify what uh, Mark just said there. <clears throat> um, I mean, Constantine, you asked me the, you know, the, the question about what will happen in the United States. And look, and I think in, in many respects, everything that we've heard today, I mean, all of the presentations um, and all, all of the um, points on the floor are extraordinarily valid. Our problem is we lost the ball. Now, I don't think anybody here in the Baltic states, Finland <coughs> and Sweden and Norway and you know, anywhere on Russia's borders, Poland included, lost the ball on what was going on. But in the United States, for sure, the ball was lost. There was no eye on the ball. And it gets really to the kind of point that Matt was making about 2008. There was, a, there was just a woeful underestimation um, of, of Russia and the ability to play um, weak cards very well. I, um, when I was doing my dissertation, procrastinated by playing hearts on uh, the computer. And you can win against the computer playing low cards because the computer is stuck towards playing uh, for the trump cards. Just any of you who want to play hearts, go out and play hearts because this will give you an idea of, of, of how you can outmaneuver everybody. And it's basically that it's the politics of fear because if you're, if you're fearful of something, you're driven to then kind of figure out how you protect yourself. And then you figure out how you exploit the weakness of others. And that's what Putin and the people around him are all about. I mean, as Andre is saying, absolutely right. We are weak and we are fragmented. And the question, you know, getting to the United States is, is can we get our act together? And the United States must not have a standalone Russia policy. The people in this room here, this is the solution. I mean, I'm looking around this audience and thinking, we have the collective ability here to figure out how to manage this problem. The problem is how do we all act together and not be divided among ourselves and fighting over ourselves about our different assessments or our own different agendas. That is really, I mean, as Mark is saying here, um, which is gives the capacity for Russia to exploit and to play on um, all of our own divisions. And Russia actually believes that it's doing to us what is done to it. Everything that Putin talks about in his speeches and on the behalf of others is about retaining Russian unity, not having fractions, not having divisions that are skull. You know, because otherwise, if you, do, if you get Raskol and, and schism, you get Raspad and collapse. And it's playing this back against us. So it's incumbent upon everybody here in this room to basically figure this out. We've got the capacity to do this. And we've got to basically keep our eyes on the ball, which means more resources. And I'm not just saying it on behalf of uh, think tank Landia, as Mark uh, 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 heard was probably being called uh, um, earlier. Mike Carpenter called um, about think tank Landia you know, against uh, David and uh, one of the uh, breakfast attack. meetings. It was a vicious attack. <laughs> but think tank Landia, universities, the Merit Larry uh, 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 conferences, um, we all need um, uh, basically attention being paid to this so we can have more of these discussions. We need more ability to talk to Harinda. Uh, to our colleagues in Japan uh, and to many others who are dealing uh, with the Russian um, challenge. Because this is the only way that we're actually going to find the solution. So we need, we need more of this and we need much more attention and resources paid to um, figuring out how we're going to work on all this together. And we have to stop uh, with the United States, uh, any idea whether it's Trump or Clinton, uh, thinking that the United States can figure out these um, issues alone. So let's just start, um, please, Constantine, let start lobbying your favorite person on, actually, we don't know quite on whose Trump team um, is, but I think we've got some Clinton uh, team in the audience here of figuring out how we can uh, make sure we lash all of this up again after November. Well, just to, in closing, pick up on one point uh, that's been talked about. Uh, at the risk of sounding glib, I would argue that Putin's greatest export is corruption. But in order to export it, we import it. 
We need to do a much better job at looking at ourselves in the mirror, cleaning up our own act, and not leaving ourselves vulnerable to Russian infiltration, which winds up destroying the integrity of our own institutions and the very values and principles upon which we stand. Please join me in thanking a terrific panel here.